If you've raised kids, you can manage anything. That's the name of the, a book written by Anne Crittenden. And in that, she tells various stories of uh, ways that she's seen parents deal with children. Uh, and she tells of one visit to the Galapagos Islands, where she observed the parenting practices of a bird called the blue-footed booby. I'm not making this up. You know, truth is stranger than fiction. It's really called the blue-footed booby. And this bird hatches two eggs every time uh, they lay eggs. And she watches these two eggs very closely to see which of the newborn chicks is the most likely to survive. That one she keeps. The other one she pushes out of the nest to die. Anne Crittenden wrote, small children view any trace of parental favoritism with the same panic that must be felt by the luckless booby chick. Every parent has heard, her piece is bigger than mine. I want one just like John's. You love him better than you love me. Unfairness can feel like a matter of life and death. And at one time, it probably was. The oldest contention in society is, that's not fair. Remember Adam and Eve and their two boys, Cain and Abel? Cain and Abel bring their offerings before God. God accepts Abel's offering, but not Cain's. That's not fair, Cain thought. And his resulting anger was the source of humanity's first murder. So we hear it not only among children, but among adults as well. That's not fair. It's one of the reasons we have judges and lawyers, and if, if things get out of hand, we have the police. It's the reason why some families fall apart after the reading of the will. It's why some people in society will always feel victimized. Life's not fair. Now, I'm not going to ask any of you if you've ever experienced inequality in the workplace, because I think almost every hand in the sanctuary would go up. But I want to tell you a story that Steve Shepard tells. It's about a man who owned a small farm in South Georgia. The wage and hour department claimed that he was not paying proper wages to his help, and so they sent an agent out to interview the farmer. The agent said, well, just give me your list of employees and tell me how much they make. All right, said the farmer. I have a hired man, been with me for three years. I pay him $600 a week plus room and board, and I have a cook. She's been with me six months. I pay her $500 a week plus room and board. Anybody else? The agent asked. Oh yeah, the farmer said, there's a half-wit here, works 18 hours a day. I pay him about $10 a week and give him a tobacco allowance. Ah, that's the employee I want to interview, said the agent. You're talking to him now. At every layer of society, someone is complaining, that's not fair. Jesus told a parable about a landowner who went out early in the morning. At least I think six o'clock in the morning is early. Um, but he goes out to hire workers for the vineyard. It was a common practice in that part of the world, particularly during grape harvest. Storms could easily ruin a, a crop, and so when it was ready, it had to be harvested very quickly. So for a time, anyone who wanted a job could have one. The work was hard. The hours were dawn to sunset, which in a Mediterranean country means a 12-hour work day. The wage was a standard one, a denarius, a silver coin. 
An Anglican pastor, Tom Chesterton, makes the point that a denarius was not only the average daily wage for a worker, but it was also the average cost of surviving per day for the masses of poor. It didn't allow any room to maneuver. A denarius would buy a family just what they needed to stay alive. No more, no less. So a full day's work and a full day's wage were essential to survival. During the grape harvest, men who wanted to work would gather in the marketplace and wait to be hired. Same system is still used today. Laborers gather. We all know where to go and pick up somebody uh, to, to do some work for us. They would work a 12-hour shift. They'd be paid at the end of every day so that each man could go and buy food to feed his family that day. If a man was unable to find work on a particular day, his family would not eat. If he found work for only part of the day, family would eat a little bit, but it wouldn't stave off the hunger pains. Now I hope this helps you appreciate what is at stake for the workers in this story. It's not only about fairness. For some workers, it's about survival. Jesus said to his followers, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they had received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But the landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of God for the people of God. This is a parable about generosity, God's generosity. God pours out grace full and completely on all who will receive it. We who have labored in the vineyard as Christians for most of our lives think that we will get an extra measure of grace in return for our many years of service. It won't happen. It cannot happen. God's love is without limits. God pours out grace without reservation and without regard to who deserves it and who does not. If that bothers you, get over it. There are no limits on grace. If it exceeds everything we could have ever hoped for, everything we could ever have expected, how can one person say that they got less than another? That's grace. 
It's poured out in infinite quantities on you and on me. It is totally unearned. Whether we have labored for Jesus for 50 years or 50 minutes. All we have to do to receive God's grace is to open our hearts to it. To some people, it doesn't seem fair. But it is a fact. No wonder it's often called amazing grace. The writer Philip Yancey tells about when the journalist Bill Moyers created a documentary based on the hymn Amazing Grace. Did some of you see that? It was wonderful. Um, one of the film's mo more unusual scenes took place at a massive benefit concert in England. All day, the fans had been blasted with hard-driving rock music, and they were just so energized. Even looking at it on TV screen, you could just see the energy that was there. They were enjoying it so much. But strangely, the concert organizer scheduled opera singer Jesse Norman to close the concert. Fans reacted negatively when Miss Norman took the stage. Here was a middle-aged black woman without any backup band, depending completely on her voice. She silenced the crowds with her opening line. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And soon, thousands of hard rock fans were singing along with her. Many of you may have seen the 1998 movie Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan is a, about the invasion of Normandy in World War II. Ken Onstott summed it up this way. He said, the movie opens with an elderly man walking through a cemetery perched on the cliffs above the Normandy beach. He approaches a grave in the cemetery, kneels down, starts crying. Suddenly the movie jumps back for 54 years to the day of the invasion. And for the next 20 minutes, we watch one of the most horrifying war sequences ever filmed. In fact, I watched 30 seconds of that sequence and then went like this for the rest of it. I couldn't take it. Because it seems like the movie shows every single person who was hurt or died that day in vivid detail. But finally a beachhead is established and for a moment the troops are safe. But then the real plot of the movie begins. Eight soldiers who survived the invasion are sent to rescue an American paratrooper, Private Ryan. They go through harrowing experiences to find him, and once they find him, several of the men lose their lives trying to rescue him. The last one killed is the captain of the unit, played by Tom Hanks. And as he dies, he says to Private Ryan, earn this. At that moment, the movie switches back to the gray-haired man at the cemetery. And we realize that we are looking at Private Ryan, now in his 70s. And he's kneeling before the grave of the captain who gave his life for him. Slowly, Ryan stands and turns to his wife and says, tell me I've been a good person. His wife is puzzled. She doesn't understand the question, but those who have been seeing the movie, understand it completely. Ryan is asking her, tell me that my life was worth saving. Tell me that I fulfilled the purpose for which the captain gave his life. That's how many of us feel about our lives. 
We know that God's grace is free. We know that we did nothing to deserve it. But we also know that Jesus paid the cost with his life. We hunger in our hearts to think that our lives lived in response to his self-giving love are proving worthy of that act. Otherwise, what kind of people would we be? Amazing grace. It's not fair, it's not just, it is simply unbelievable. Unbelievable generosity. And it's all ours today for the taking.